Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, get a couple things going here. It does look like it's nine o'clock. I'm just gonna give it just a minute here or so and see if we have anybody else joining us before we get started. Okay, it doesn't look like anybody's waiting. I'll go ahead and um, click the record button here. All right. Well, welcome everyone to our um, third day of just um, the payroll overview. Um, I think everybody that was um, that's here today was you know, on yesterday, but just again, to reiterate that we will um, have the recording links um, updated on this page here, which is under our trainings and registration page. And then um, the ITC only, um, I can show you here just to make sure we're all on the same page. But as mentioned yesterday, um, from our trainings, meetings and trainings page. If you go to the ITC overview training section, um, you know, today we're gonna pick up where we left off yesterday and we're gonna go through sort of the after the payroll process steps and <clears throat> we'll break the recording that um, we've done today down into the different um, sections. So, you know, if you or somebody at, a, you're one of your users wants to, you know, just really tune in on, you know, processing employer paid benefits. They can click this link here and it's gonna take them directly to that place in the um, YouTube video. So again, we'll have this um, broken down um, after, you know, as time allows shortly after our training um, is over. So um, I wanted to follow up on a few things that we talked about um, yesterday. Um, I, I'm not sure if I didn't have enough coffee or what I was thinking, but as I was preparing for today, um, it hit me that when we were talking about initializing a payroll, um, so when you initialize a payroll, um, when we talked about the pay cycle, I believe I took you to um, the incorrect place. Again, I'm not sure what I was thinking. Um, I think I took you to the payroll item configuration screen and said that it matched the pay cycle, um, you know, with the pay cycle that you enter when you initialize the payroll. Um, that is not correct. So the pay cycle here, um, so if I select first pay of the month, second pay of the month, um, that directly relates to the payroll item itself. So it hit me when I was, again, um, preparing for today. And I'm like, I'm not even sure why I said that. So I wanted to correct that and make it um, make you aware that it's actually the um, pay cycle that's on the individual payroll item. So this payroll pay cycle here is getting matched with the pay cycle that you enter when you um, initialize the pay, not the payroll item configuration, as I think I said yesterday. I think my mind goes too many different directions and um, obviously it took me in the wrong one. So I wanted to clarify that. We'll talk about the pay cycle on the payroll item configuration um, when we talk about the actual paying of deductions or creating your payables. Um, the other thing I wanted to follow up on, I did have a, a conversation with um, uh, the developers when it came to that configuration option that we talked about um, and setting that um, payment printing configuration. And I talked about how you can um, select the default direct deposit form, and then that should um, default when we, we when we went to create those payments um, in the um, payroll process. And, and that didn't seem to be working correctly. Um, the it seems that when we implemented that configuration option, we sort of left off that connection. Um, the connection that does work though, is if you go to payments 
payroll and you try to re and you try to print the payment from this grid, it defaults here. So if I would select direct deposit PDF, see how my direct deposit form now shows up um, as expected. So um, we are going to, we have a couple of JIRA issues in place to default um, that when you process the payments during the actual payroll process. So if I go back to the details of my payroll yesterday, this is what we were, I was trying to you know show you and that didn't seem to be working correctly. Um, we have uh, issues 1237 and 1666 in place um, to sort of um, make that work as, you know, so no matter where you print the payment, it should automatically default to um, however you have that configuration option set. Um, to piggyback that off of that a little bit, um, those issues do address the fact that um, if I go to select um, or go to, to look at this drop down, um, in the future, you will have the ability to delete um, any of these forms that are no longer being used. So right now, any form that you've imported um, is going to display in this drop down along with the default form. Um, so part of that, those issues is to clean um, that up a little bit. So you have the ability to control, you know, maybe I only ever want to show um, the, you know, direct deposit with new W-4 form, um, you know, so I don't incorrectly select something and, and, and generate those forms um, in the wrong format. So you will have that ability as well. So I just wanted to follow up on those two pieces. Again, I I don't think I had enough coffee or something yesterday. I'm like, why would I say that? So I wanted to follow up and um, correct myself and what I said. Are there any questions about either of those two points? Um, hopefully that makes it a little more clear. Okay, all right, well then if there are no questions, we're gonna continue, like I said um, before, with um, where we left off yesterday. Um, and yesterday we did, you know, um, schedule those direct deposit notices. We talked about the job scheduler. Um, one thing about the job scheduler, keep in mind, um, you know, districts can go out there and delete those scheduled jobs themselves. So if um, they're, you know, they realize that they were scheduled for the wrong date, um, the wrong time, both, you know, either or, um, they can go out to the job scheduler now and actually delete those um, jobs themselves. I don't know if for those of you have, that have been around for some time um, in the classic system, that would be something that users would have to, districts would have to reach out to the ITC for, and those um, would have to be deleted um, by you or someone at the ITC. So that is no longer the case. Um, those jobs can be deleted. Um, they would simply go back then and, you know, schedule those email notices for the, the correct date and time. All right. Okay. Well, we're going to move along then um, and pick up um, with step 25 um, on our checklist. And that is to actually create the um, SERS per pay report. Um, along with the submission file. So we all know SERS can be a little a little tricky, um, maybe not as, as user-friendly, so to speak, as STRS is, um, but it is what it is. So um, in our documentation, we do have, oops, we do have the information um, as to what actually um, qualifies, um, you know, or what, uh, let me re re restart this. Okay. Um, SERS per pay report. We're going to go down to reports and SERS reporting and then SERS per pay report. Um, again, there are um, helpful dates down below um, in this grid here. 
you can enter the use this to enter, know what start date you need to enter, um, what stop date you need to enter, um, and the pay date as well. So these dates all come into play um, up here. So we would enter, you know, our start date of six um, fifteen twenty three through six thirty of um, twenty twenty three. The pay cycle um, is, you know, is this uh, district set up to be um, probably either um, biweekly or semi monthly? Sometimes they need to schedule like a special pay, for instance they might be using the other pay cycle for that. It's kind of something outside of their norm. But these schedules are all set up um, with SERS. And so, you know, districts are gonna have to work with SERS to know their schedule and, you know, what exactly, um, you know, how those pay cycles should be entered um, here. And then the, you're, they're gonna enter their pay cycle code. Um, so usually this is, you know, 0001, um, maybe those districts that use um, multiple start and end dates, they might be running this report for, um, you know, two different date ranges. So they're going to have two different pay cycle codes. So they would use the pay cycle of biweekly, semi-monthly, pay cycle code might be 0002 and then they're gonna use their other start and stop date, okay? So, you know, first, obviously, they're gonna to want to um, process the report. So um, you have the ability to start each employee on, new page, on, on a new page, which I'm not sure that that's something that they would want to do. Um, they do wanna show the details so that they can review this information and then probably want to also show any warnings or informational messages on the report. So these two um, options by default are checked. Um, and then we're gonna generate the report. Oops, sorry about that. It didn't enter the pay date. Let's try that one more time. Okay, so I think I already have the report open up here, yes. Okay, so here's our SERS per pay report. Now, districts are gonna wanna look at this report and, and compare um, and verify some information. You know, the first is based on the earn code, which is listed in this column here, certain earn codes require days and hours be reported. So you can see here, this line has a, an informational message, a warning, because this earn code of 01 requires days and hours. And you can see here that there's days that are missing. We have the hours, but we don't have days included. So in the documentation, we do have um, the, the various earn codes um, specified or laid out here. And then sort of a note as to, you know, whether they require days and hours, can't have days and hours, um, and those sorts of things. These are all SERS rules, so it's not something that you know state software is dreaming up or <laughs> trying to make anybody's life more difficult. These um, are put into place because that's how SERS expects those to be reported, okay? All right, um, going back to our report then, um, so again, earnings, various earnings codes have to have days and hours or cannot have days or hours. So an 04 is basically saying it's being paid out of accrued wages. So those days and hours when the regular, when they actually earned the um, uh, regular wages, those days and hours have already been counted. So we're just paying them then something, you know, that's been accrued that's that's owed to them. So we're not gonna double up on those days and hours so they cannot have days and hours reported. So no matter how hard a district tries to add adjustments, um, those days and hours are not gonna be populated on the report and or the submission file. Okay, the next thing that um, districts, you know, when they're going through all the various reports basically that we're gonna talk about 
um, this morning, they're going to probably want to go back to some sort of report that says, hey, is this amount here that I'm reporting to SERS and I'm going to, you know, process my payment for, is that actually accurate? So what was withheld during the payroll? <clears throat> so when I go back to the payroll item detail report, this tells me then exactly what was withheld. Do I not have this open? Oh, I'm sorry. I ran it for multiple uh, payroll items. That's right. So here's our uh, uh, SERS amount. So does the amount withheld here match my um, report? So if I go back to my report here, the I have $681.73 on my report. And I also have that amount on my payroll item detail report as showing that's what was withheld from all the employees um, during the payroll process. Now, this is a very basic um, payroll. So we don't have anybody in our payroll that we're um, using as our sample as um, being picked up. So obviously, if you have you know um, employees that are having their retirement picked up, you would be adding the 690 along with the 590 to get the amount that's reported on the SERS per pay report. Okay, we have a really easy sample. So in the real world, you're probably adding those two amounts together. So those amounts match, so we're, we're good. Um, going back to then, you know, if these days or hours are not correct, adjustments can be used. So under core, we can go to core adjustments. And where we could create then an adjustment for that employee for days and hours. Now, keep in mind, we did just recently make an, uh, an enhancement to um, uh, when you choose a payroll item, it's going to qualify then and only list those um, types that match this particular payroll item. So if you're used to seeing like a longer list and more, you know, more than normal, um, that's because of an enhancement we just recently um, released. So you will only see the types listed from the dropdown that apply to that specific payroll item. So when it comes to days and hours, because we did just recently get questions on this, um, the days and hours for retirement don't really apply to a specific payroll item. So you do not have to choose a payroll item at all in order for those hours or, and or days to be picked up on the report. So you simply choose, you know, in this case, it would be STRS um, days, hours, whatever you need to um, uh, add the adjustment for, maybe it's both, um, in order to make that report correct, okay? Um, when it comes to dates, those can be tricky. So in our um, adjustments chapter, um, in the documentation, we do have an explanation um, outlining that for days and hours, basically that has to fall within the pay period beginning and ending dates. So it's not the pay date, it has to be a date within the period start and end date, okay, for both STRS days and hours. Okay, I know those dates can be tricky sometimes, so you know, this helps point you in the right direction. Okay. All right. I think that was all I had about um, the STRS report. So then obviously once you've generated that report multiple times if, if necessary um, to make sure that all the information is accurate, um, then we're going to go to reports, SCRS reporting, and go back to that STRS per pay report option. And this time, you know, 
Again, we'll have to enter our pay date, our start and end dates. Um, we're going to generate the submission file. Um, so once you've uh, created that submission file, then you can actually link um, directly to ESERS and upload that file. So if I would click here, that takes me right to that um, uh, self-service self -service portal on ESERS website and allows me to upload my um, per pay file. Now, one thing we wanna make sure that we don't miss is um, creating an adjustment file. So if you have any kind of, let's go back to that, um, where do I have that at? Sorry, I have so many tabs open. Um, anything on the report with an earn code, um, starting out with five, um, that usually means that something was docked or something was adjusted. So an adjustment file needs to be created for in addition to the regular file. So it's basically, you know, saying this is my regular information and that's going to be reported in the, the regular per pay file. But I have an adjustment that may have taken place, you know, in a prior submission file that I need to correct. Um, so in that case, um, we also need to create that adjustment file, which is clicking this option here. And then we're going to submit both the regular file and the adjustment file when we upload um, information to eSERS. Okay. All right. Any questions about SCRS and reporting information to um, eSERS? Okay. We'll move on then to the STRS per pay report and submission file. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, it's probably, they're probably a little, little more user friendly um, in the fact that they don't require quite as much, uh, you know, there's no earn codes involved um, and that sort of thing. There's the advance, so maybe we <laughs> will give them that and they're, they're equal. Um, but uh, from the grid down below, you're gonna select the payroll um, by pay date that we want the, the report and then eventually the submission file to be generated for. Um, you have your normal sort options. Um, I'm not even sure that they accept physical checks anymore. Um, so this is kind of irrelevant. Um, uh, we still have it on the, the screen obviously, but it, it's not really used for anything. Um, I know in the past when you were physically sending a check, um, then you could, you know, specify check and then enter um, a check number. Um, first, obviously, we want to generate the report. Um, so we're going to click the generate report option, and that's going to generate our STRS per pay report. So in this case, again, a very simple sample. Um, we have one employee. Um, that's being reported. Um, keep in mind the days paid are included on the per pay report. However, this does not, those days do not get included um, when on the submission file that uh, districts send to STRS. This just allows districts the means to balance that on a per pay basis versus at the end of the fiscal year when you know you're you're trying to run the advance and and balance that, um, you know if we've been checking these on a per pay basis, then when it comes time to you know calculate service credit and and look at those days, um, you know as a whole, um, then it should be easier to to find out you know where the mistake may lie. So we do put those on the per pay report. They are not. Um, reported on the submission file that goes on a per pay basis to STRS. Um, again, um, you know, this is obviously, um, again, another place where we want to check the payment amount. So, you know, here in this case, um, the, the total payment that we're going to 
send to STRS and that will be included in the submission file um, is $181.25. So on that payroll item detail report again, going back to that, um, on from our, our payroll that we uh, processed, does, does that amount match what was withheld from our employees? And it does. Again, if you have pickup, which is probably the case, then we're going to be adding the 691 to the 591 to arrive at our total. Um, and in this case, you know, we just have um, a very simple sample and then we just have those regular type of um, retirement withholdings, no pickup. Okay. All right. So once we've generated the report, we've balanced that, we've we've checked it over, things are good. Um, STRS, the submission option here is just slightly different. We have a couple options. You have the ability to create the file and then go down and you're actually would, you know, browse to find that file and then submit it to STRS. So there's kind of a couple clip clicks involved, a couple steps here, or you can simply create the submission file and submit it to STRS all in one step. So if you're confident enough and you know that's how um, you know you'd like to to get that file to STRS, you have the ability to you know click once and take care of that or if you like control over generating it and, and sending it, um, you have that ability as well. It just takes a couple little extra clicks there to, to make that happen. Okay, um, if there are, um, I should point out that going back to like using adjustments, if, if something needs to be um, adjusted before you submit that file, um, Again, the, the adjustment date must fall within the pay period beginning and ending date. So it's the same as STRS or SCRS, I'm sorry, they work the same. So I just wanted to I kind of um, stumbled over that. And I did want to point out that that is spelled out in the documentation as well. So if there are any questions, um, you know, you can refer to the adjustments chapter and, and look under those specific adju adjustment types. Um, STRS does not care about hours. Um, so, you know, they're really, that's why it's not listed on the report. It's not listed on the, anything at the fiscal year end, um, reporting at all. So they just care about days. Okay. So that is, um, STRS, the per STRS and STRS is per pay reporting, um, Next is to actually report those STRS and SERS new hires. So if you have any new hires um, uh, that were paid during the payroll, those um, the, their information needs to be sent to the appropriate um, retirement system. So that's what step 27 and 28 are. Um, we have a little, um, you know, informational box here on the checklist that kind of outlines what pieces need to be in place in order for um, an employee to appear on the report. So in the case of an SERS employee, um, the um, SERS uh, option has to be defined um, on the payroll item. The new employee box has to be checked and then there has to be a position retirement code and a position start date no more than 60 days prior to um, the system date in order for that employee to be eligible. Okay, so just to kind of, we have this in the documentation as well. Um, if I go to the new hire chapter, we have it spelled out here um, too. So. Uh, if we follow along with what um, we just talked about, the employee has to have, I'm going to go to a 400 here. 
So this type has to be set to SERS. And um, the new hire checkbox has to be um, checked. So going and showing you where that is. This new employee box is checked here. And then it also has to have a position. So we're going, going to go to the position um, screen. They have to have a position start date within, um, I think we actually changed that to be 60 days. Um, it looks like our documentation differs from what we have in the checklist. I'll verify that, but I'm pretty sure that we changed that to be 60. Um, I'll double check on that. I never noticed that, that we had that different in those two different places. Um, so again, um, the position start date, and I think that's what um, people miss sometimes. Um, so if I go to position, position start date on the position record. So this is the date here that the system is looking um, and you know going back um, in time. And if it's within that time period, then it will be included at you know on the new hire report um, if all the other um, requirements that we just talked about are valid. So it's not this higher date, and I think people sometimes get um, mistaken and you know look at the higher date instead of the start date. Okay. All right. So if all of those pieces are in place, when we go to run. Um, the new hire report, which is under the SCRS reporting option, you're gonna see that this employee um, is listed here. Now keep in mind, SCRS does require an employee to have an, an email listed, okay? And they also like step that up and, and they also want that email address to be outside of um, their, uh, the, um, regular district um, email address. So this is required by SERS. Um, you can see on the grid, you know, basically everything that's going to be included in the report. But if I go ahead and include or generate that new hire report, it tells me then, you know, basically everything that's going to be included in that submission file. And you can see here we have an error. Gender is required. So we would have to fill in that gender um, field on the employee record um, in order for there it not to be an error when it gets uploaded to um, SERS. All right. So once we've verified that all the information is accurate, everything is correct, then we're going to click the generate file option. And then we would go log into ESERS and that file would be uploaded. Um, and then, you know, a CRS processes them as a new hire. Um, I know it used to be the case where you wanted to process the new hire um, file prior to your regular SERS file. I don't know if that's still the case or not with SERS. I think I remembered um, at one time if districts, if they processed your regular SERS file and this new um, hire employee was within that file, which they would be, um, it would kind of flag an error because they haven't been, that new hire hasn't been processed through their system yet. I'm not sure if that's still the case, if they've kind of um, lifted those restrictions or not, but um, I know that that, that did, um, at one time flag an error with SERS. So districts may want to, you know, move this around in the, the checklist. And again, this is just a, you know, as Andrea mentioned on you know the first day, this is just a sample. Um, districts are going to tweak this and make this their own according to, you know, their needs. Maybe they don't use everything we're talking about so they can remove those parts um, and so forth. So um, again, if that's still the case, they might want to move this ahead of um, the regular SERS reporting so that um, 
it's not, you know, SERS doesn't flag any kind of error. All right. When it comes to um, then the STRS new hire reporting, um, it's basically the same, I you know, the same concept. Um, they have to have the S the STRS or the 450 payroll item. That new employee box has to be checked. And then again, that position um, retirement code on the STRS record has to be um, set to STRS and the position start date um, cannot be any, um, you know, outside of that 60 day window. So, and I think we've made that the same for both SERS and STRS, but I will double, like I said, I'll double check on that. So again, the same concept as what we talked about with SERS, um, in order for those um, new hires to be um, up here on the new hire grid. So using that same concept, we're gonna now switch and go to the STRS reporting option, and we're gonna go to STRS new hire. And you can see here, because we have an employee that meets all of that criteria that we just talked about, um, they're listed then on, you know, here. Um, it allows us to generate a report just like SERS. And you can see all the information then um, that will be included in the submission file. And then once we verified everything is accurate, again, just like the STRS per pay report, we have the ability to create the new hire submission file and then upload that in a couple steps, or we can generate the submission file and submit it to STRS all in one step. Okay. All right. I think the key, you know, to both of these new hire reporting um, reports in the submission is to like, you know, what, why is an employee not appearing, um, you know, in the grid um, and we expect it to. So, you know, use that criteria that we talked about and chances are maybe a date is, you know, outside of the range. Maybe, um, you know, somebody didn't get flagged, that checkbox didn't get set as a new employee, um, you know, something got, over, something got overlooked. So those uh, steps, these uh, checks and balances, so to speak, can, can be helpful to figure that out. All right, step 29 then is um, the ODJFS new hire reporting. Um, so just like the retirement system, these employees have to be um, reported as new hires when it comes to ODJFS. Um, let me... So when it comes to um, ODJFS new hire reporting um, in our documentation, we talk about you know what um, qualifies and makes those employees appear on that grid. Um, and ODJFS new hire report uses the ODJFS hire date. Okay, so if I go to core and then the employee, look at this first employee here. If I scroll down, um, the date is listed here and then there's a checkbox. So the ODJFS checkbox tells us then whether that employee um, is reportable or not. So here is the ODJFS reportable box. Now don't get that mistaken with the new hire reported ODJFS checkbox. Once an employee has been included in a submission file, this checkbox automatically gets checked and says, hey, this employee has been reported now, don't include them in upcoming submission files. So we wanna only check this reportable box and enter the date um, and then leave this box alone and the system's gonna do um, the work and check that box once they've been included um, in a submission file, okay? so. Don't get the dates confused with the hire date. 
these are two separate fields. Um, so the ODJFS hire date is what the system is actually looking at. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and close out of this. And if I go to um, reports, ODJFS reporting and ODJFS new hire report, um, you can see in this case, I have two employees um, that meet the criteria that we just talked about. So they're ones then that we um, have the ability to generate um, and include in our submission file. So you can either single click and then use the arrow to move those over to the reported, the employees you want to include in the report. Um, I can also um, highlight the first and then hit my shift key and highlight my, that is going to highlight, in this case, we only have two, so it doesn't appear to demonstrate. It's a little tricky, um, but that would highlight the entire list. So if I had multiple, you know, I click on my first and highlight that, I would go down to the end of the list, hit my shift key, click on that um, employee, and it's going to highlight everybody that's in between um, where I started and where I ended. So then I can, you know, just click the arrow key and move those employees over. Um, I can also double click to move them back and forth. So just, just a little helpful, um, some helpful tips there if, if you're not aware of that. Now, um, ODJFS does require um, a header row um, in the in its submission files. So we're going to click this box, and that that will then. Um, prevent that first row um, from being omitted from um, reporting altogether. So I don't know if you've had districts that have, you know, maybe they had 10 employees um, that they um, report, want to report to ODJFS. They create the submission file. This checkbox is not checked. And when they go to upload that file to ODJFS, it's only showing nine employees being um, uploaded and reported. That's because they they assume that every file, that first row is just a header row. So they automatically basically probably delete that row and then report every line after that, um, which in you know the case if you if it's not a header row, it's a true employee, that employee is going to be omitted from the file um, and, and not reported. So if you have a district that, you know, reports that that's the case, chances are they didn't include this header, they didn't check this box, and so that first row got totally omitted um, and, and deleted from reporting. So we do want to make sure that this is checked. And then again, obviously, we want to generate the file, or I'm sorry, the, the report before the file. Verify everything looks, you know, looks good. And then we're going to go back and we're going to generate the um, submission file. And then this gets uploaded um, for reporting. Okay. All right. So that's the new hire reporting. Are there any questions when it comes to um, retirement or ODJFS new hire reporting? All right, those pieces haven't changed for quite some time. So hopefully everybody's you know, a veteran at it by now. All right, next we're gonna move on to the afford report. Um, and we have some information in the documentation that I wanted to point out because I think it can be super helpful when this report is um, new to users. And again, for those not familiar with what this report um, is doing, it's basically um, <clears throat> to help determine those employees that exceed 30 hours a week. Um, if you're on the biweekly um, pay schedule, or 130 hours per month if you're paying semi-monthly um, to be classified as full-time under the Affordable Care Act. So that's that's basically 
what this report is doing. Um, so down here, I know that the dates, I think, can be get a little messy sometimes. So we have it spelled out with some examples, and I thought I would point those out. Um, so again, basically, it's you know broken down with whether you're paying weekly or monthly or, or, or reporting, I should say, weekly or monthly. Um, you know, those dates should always be the first day in the beginning date from your first payroll. So that's the, the start date in your measurement period. Um, and then the end date down here, it will always be the last period ending date from your last payroll that you want included. Okay, so that's for weekly. Monthly, it's the first pay that you want included in that measurement period. Um, and then the last, the ending date of the last um, day of the month for your last payroll in your measurement period. Okay, so we have a note here. I think sometimes they, you know, districts want to use um, uh, for semi-monthly. If they, if you don't use the 15th or the last day of, of, of the month, you'll want to use the period ending date of the last pay of your payroll. Okay, so we kind of have some examples here. Um, even if you're using like different sets of dates for different pay period or pay groups, I'm sorry. Um, so this kind of hopefully helps outline how um, that information should, should be entered because it is a little confusing. The options then in the report, um, we've kind of have this spelled out pretty clearly here. Um, if you want to exclude um, based on termination date. Um, so you do not have to report terminated employees. So, you know, if, if, if that's, you know, still the case, which I don't know why you wouldn't want it to be, um, this box, you know, you'll want that box checked. If you want to exclude employees with insurance, um, then you can check the box to, you know, include or exclude those. Um, you want to set or determine, you know, how the system should calculate um, based on weeks or months. So again, we have, you know, if you're paying 26 pays, then you'll use the weekly option. If you're paying based on semi-monthly, um, then you'll use the monthly option. You can select, you know, a calendar for breaks. And then obviously select by pay groups or employee, um, you have that ability as well. So if I go to reports and I actually show you this, I kind of wanted to step through those options, um, you know, that we have, how we have those outlined in the documentation to hopefully help um, explain it a little clearer. So I'm going to put in then my start date. Oops. I got an extra six here. Sorry about that and my end date. And I'm just gonna go ahead and generate my report. Taking a bit. Okay, so this, you know, is basically what the report looks like. And it's just, you know, determining, like we talked about, um, you know, based on the Affordable Care Act rules, if an employee, you know, is was considered, had enough hours to be considered full-time within that, um, that measuring period. So once the report is, you know, generated and looked over and it's accurate, um, then you can generate a CSV file of that information, and then that gets uploaded then to whatever um, you know uh, third party they're using to um, uh, you know maintain that information. Um, you probably they probably have some sort of company that they um, you know might be using to to oversee that. Okay. All right. 
That is the, um, the afford report. Next, we're gonna move on to a couple um, benefit uh, processing programs. So one being the employer distribution and one being the employer, distrib uh, employer, employer retirement share. So, you know, we've processed the payroll um, through the payroll, you know, it's board benefits are withheld, obviously not from the employee's um, pay paycheck. Those are paid by the board, but now we need a means to like process them through the system so that we can, you know, charge the right accounts and then actually pay those um, payments on the, on the USAS side. So a lot of districts use employer distribution um, to, you know, help that sort of main mainstream that process. So instead of them having to go payroll by payroll and creating a, a purchase order with all the accounts, with all the amounts manually, um, this, this sort of does the, the work for them. So it's... Employer distribution is, you know, kind of a beast in itself. Um, I'm not going to lie. Uh, it's a little, it, it can take some getting used to as far as like how the system is um, determining the accounts that it's charging and amounts that it's charging. Um, so to take a quick look at that, here's what the actual um, report looks like. So the very first thing, and I believe it or not, I think districts just skip this part. Um, I'm not sure, you know, how, but this is, you know, the report part is so important. Um, they first want to run the report and then they're going to generate the submission file. So it's kind of like a projection versus actual. Um, we want to make sure that the report is reporting the, you know, the submission file is going to include the, the uh, correct information. So we always want to run the report first. So in the start and end dates, we always want these this to be the um, pay date. So everything is based off of the history, based on the pay date. Um, this can be run. Um, districts might run this multiple times. Um, maybe we're um, running it every pay for things like retirement, um, board share of retirement, board share of Medicare. Um, it might also be the end of the month. And maybe it's also time for us to um, run our payment for our board payment for insurances. So we might be, you know, at different times of the month um, running this differently. So again, you know, the, the date range then that we use is going to also um, play a factor in um, maybe what pay of the month it is. So if I'm running this for um, things like insurances that might be withheld twice a month, um, but I'm only paying it, you know, processing that board payment at the end of the month, I'm going to use both pay dates um, in my start and end date. So this start date would be my first pay date of the month, and then my ending date would be my last pay of the month. So that's going to grab everything for the entire month and not just, you know, one pay. Um, more than likely, we're going to, you know, skip this payment cycle here and we're going to go down and we're going to select um, specific payroll items to be paid. So in our example, I'm just going to use Medicare to keep it a little um, more simple. So I'm actually selecting and saying for this pay date, grab the information for Medicare for the board share of Medicare and, you know, capture all of those amounts, accounts, um, so that I can, you know, review it, look at it, and eventually um, create the payment for it. Um, <clears throat> you can sort this then by payroll item code or account. We're going to keep it at, you know, payroll item, even though we're just selecting one. Um, most generally, I think that's how districts run it. You know, I'm gonna, I want everything grouped together based on payroll item code, not by account. So everything for Medicare shows in a, you know, a section and everything for 
um, you know, my other board paid um, payroll item codes will show, you know, in its own section. And then I can subtotal as well. This use only employer distribution accounts option, this is super helpful um, if you determine that something's missing um, from the report. So um, chances are an employer distribution flag did not get checked on the pay um, account itself. So if I go to pay accounts and I just show you one, when I'm talking about it might make more sense. And I can you can see this right on the grid now um, on that payroll item new or I'm sorry, payroll account new grid. It's super um, nice to, to look at. But this employer distribution checkbox here is what I'm talking about. So maybe um, districts had posted a miscellaneous payment for somebody um, and they've attached that to a specific account. And that box then, that employer, this employer distribution checkbox didn't get checked. What this, going back to our employer distribution, what this checkbox does is sort of an override. Um, think of it as an override option. So if any um, you know, of those checkboxes were missed, this is gonna give us all accounts that were charged um, during the payroll process, not just those that have that checkbox marked. So if I generate this for my Medicare and I have this checkbox marked, it's only going to generate the report for those pay accounts that had that employer distribution box um, marked at the time the payroll was processed. So it's looking at history. So it doesn't matter if um, they check it now and they rerun the report, nothing's going to change. We have to use this checkbox then to, con to sort of override how that was um, flagged at the time the payroll was processed. Now, keep in mind, this is unchecking the box for all pay accounts. So there's not you know, a way to use this checkbox to just you know, make it work for a select pay account or a select few pay accounts. It's an all or nothing, okay? So when I generate this report, It's giving me then the the um, employee, the account, the and then the gross amount of their payroll, and then the amount. I want to make sure that this amount here, again, matches back to my payroll item detail report under the employer share column. If it doesn't, then that report and submission file are not going to be generated for the correct amount and the district is going to be off when they when it comes to balancing you know they're it's it's not going to be generated for the right amount they're not paying the right amount um, so that's going to be incorrect so we always want to make sure that these two amounts match if they don't chances are somebody, an employee or a pay account for an employee or pay accounts for multiple employees, that checkbox didn't get marked and it should be, should have been, okay? So now um, another means to, you know, sort of uh, take a look back at how those checkboxes were marked is the pay report. And I know that this can be quite cumbersome for um, districts, you know, larger districts, they're not gonna um, wanna go through the pay report page by page, employee by employee. But I did wanna point out that the, the flag here um, for employer distribution is on the pay report. So districts can look at, you know, that, um, how that was, you know, process how it looked at the time the pay, the pro, the payroll was processed. Now, I'm not going to go through you know the ins and outs of um, employer distribution in great detail.
detail. Um, I kind of wanted to give you, you know, an overview of how um, the system is generating the information, how you can use that flag to kind of override the accounts. But I did want to point out that we do have, um, we did a Fridays with Fiscal just on employer uh, distribution um, as well as employer retirement share. So if you go back to our, um, you know, Fridays with Fiscal and and review this, we go through this from beginning until, you know, through the entire process and kind of um, some helpful hints as far as, you know, finding employees when that doesn't, when those two amounts don't match. Um, we also included um, a report definition that can be used to um, get, generate a report. Instead of going through the pay report, you can actually use that report definition to um, you know, uh, download and import to generate a report to see how those flags were set um, at, you know, for a specific pay, uh, payroll. So that can be super helpful. So go back and review this. Obviously we don't have, you know, um, for time purposes, I, we don't just don't have enough time to go through employer distribution. We could spend a whole morning on probably um, um, covering. Another um, helpful tool, and some sometimes, um, you know, it's confusing on the account that the uh, that's listed on the report. How does this system arrive at the, the account that it's using? So we, we do have this document here whoops, that kind of steps you through the process. So I'm going to give a brief overview just to kind of point out a few things. And then again, um, you know, please review this document. Um, you know, if if you get stuck with a situation at your district as far as like how the system is, um, you know, arriving at that the account it is, um, you know, step through these examples that we have, um, and hopefully, you know, that this will be um, helpful. The first thing that it's going to do is um, it's going to look again at all the accounts that were charged that had that employer distribution checkbox marked. We've already talked about that. Then it's going to the payroll item configuration screen. So if I go to core payroll item configuration and I go down to our Medicare 692, um, these object codes here are what the system is looking at to know um, what object code to, to substitute the salary um, pay account it used during the payroll process. So, keep going to the wrong one, sorry. If the original object code falls into the certified object code category, then it's going to substitute that certified object code. If it falls within the non-certified um, object code, it's going to substitute the, um, the classified object code. If it falls into the other category, it will substitute the other object code. So that's the first thing it does is substitute the object code the original salary account object code with the benefit object code. So it's then gonna use um, the account mapping. So if we go to a utilities and we go to account mapping, it then uses the mapping. So does the original substituted object code account fall anywhere on this left side? If it does, then it it then uses the right side and says, okay, um, map it to, it now becomes the account on the right side. So I guess a couple things I wanna point out when it comes to account mapping is remember it's already substituted the object code. So we're looking for you know the account with the substituted object code. Once the account hits, and matches any line in the mapping, that's where it stops. So it's gonna be mapped to whatever account is on the right side. So it can't be mapped then, you know, on 
any further on down the list. Okay, so, you know, as a rule of thumb, you, you put your more specific accounts um, first, and then your catch-all accounts, you know, last. So the order of um, the lines is, is important. Um, you know, it, once it matches, it's, it's no longer gonna be charged anywhere else. And then lastly, and I think this is something that districts, you know, may forget about, it uses, um, oh, I'm sorry, the mapping is, is last. I skipped a step, my bad. The um, system, the configuration, the account mapping configuration um, is what's used next. And um, again, <laughs> that step, obviously, I'm forgetting it too, gets missed. So once it substitutes the object code, it goes to system, and then it goes to the account mapping configuration, and it uses these check boxes here. So if something is not checked, and that um, value was um, used when the salary, when the uh, payroll was processed, if that um, dimension of the account was used um, at the time the payroll was processed, if the checkbox is not marked, it automatically zeros that um, account dimension. So it does not carry that account dimension forward. All right, so again, I'm sorry, I, I skipped. I got these out of order. So they um, substitute it, it substitutes the object code. Then it goes to the account mapping configuration. If I'm, you know, if all of these boxes are checked, I'm carrying every dimension forward. If it's not checked, then those dimensions are automatically zeroed. Then the last step it does is go, goes to the account mapping. And if it matches any line in the account mapping, it gets mapped to that other account. Okay, so I'm sorry, I probably confused you. Um, again, we have that, um, you know, it kind of spelled out in this um, document here. We also have samples I'm, or examples. I'm gonna scroll down a little bit. So it, based on how those that checkbox is marked um, during the um, employer, distribution report, um, if it's checked or not checked, it goes through examples of, um, you know, using that checkbox. All right. So again, um, I'm not going to go, you know, into great detail. We could, we could spend a lot of time on employer distribution. Um, but that's kind of a, a basic overview, you know, go out and check that YouTube video out. Um, that Fridays with Fiscal session that we did um, that spends, you know, a whole hour um, covering um, and sort of going over that in a little more detail. Once you have the report, then um, it's accurate and it's it, it looks good. Um, everything, you know, make sure your grant accounts that maybe you've changed um, look OK. Um, everything looks um, looks good. We're going to go then to um, USAS integration, employer distribution submission, and basically we're going to enter the same options again. So again, I'm entering my pay date. Um, however, the report was generated um, using this checkbox, maybe having it on or off. We want to generate the submission file in the same exact exact manner. So. Make sure, you know, however you generated the report, you're generating um, the submission file for as well. We're going to click show submission preview. And again, um, it's, you know, making sure that my amount is correct. Once I click this submit to USAS option, it then gets sent to USAS and it's waiting um, on the USAS side in that pending transaction area um, for the process to be completed, um, you know, on the USAS side. All right. Okay. Are there any questions about employer distribution um, and what we went over regarding that? 
again, um, you know, check out the the you the phrase with fiscal um, uh, session training that we did, and I, I think you know that's gonna go into way more detail than what we're able to today. Um, next, then after we've um, created our employer distribution, so yeah, you, know, you know, again, districts might be doing you know running this. Um, option on a per pay basis for certain um, payroll items um, that are board paid. And then they might be running, you know, a different set of options because it's the end of the month and they need to process things like insurances and so forth. Um, another um, option that districts most likely, I think, are running at the end of the month um, is the employer retirement share. So this, you know, processes the board share um, of retirement um, for both SERS and STRS. Um, the option is slightly different from the employer distribution. Um, again, we're gonna be entering um, our a begin date and an end date, and this is based on the pay date. So um, most generally, most likely we're you know using that month date range. And then in this case, we're simply entering the amount that we want to distribute. So those payment amounts um, that districts get from the retirement systems, we're going to enter those amounts then um, in, you know, the appropriate uh, retirement system line. So I'm going to make something up here. and we're gonna generate the report. So again, generate the report first, um, make sure that everything, you know, looks correct. Um, you know, my mounts, my accounts and so forth, um, everything looks, looks accurate. Um, one thing to keep in mind that, um, you know, we talked about on the employer distribution side, there being that checkbox to sort of override um, how the accounts were processed through payroll and whether that employer distribution box was checked or not. Um, there is also um, under system configuration, the employer retirement share configuration um, sort of override option. So instead of it being a checkbox on the actual um, report and submission, we actually have the, uh, a configuration option that allows you to check or you know override how those accounts were flagged at the time um, the uh, payroll was processed. So we want to use this checkbox here as the override option. Okay. Once the report is generated and that looks good, then districts are going to use SAS integration again and we're gonna select the employer retirement share submission. And basically, again, we're gonna en be entering the same exact information. So I can do this real quick. Once we verify that, you know, this information is accurate, we're gonna click the show submission preview and you know, we have the whole slew of messages that are um, telling us about accounts because I didn't go that far to set anything up um, in these sample files. So <clears throat> I would expect that. Um, and then we're gonna go down to the bottom and we're gonna click um, submit employer share of retirement to USAS. So the same concept, it's gonna go to the USAS side, um, sit in the pending transaction and then from the USAS side, we're gonna, you know, process that, um, send that through the process on the USAS side to create the disbursement. Okay. Employer retirement share uses the same um, method as far as um, account mapping goes. You know, it, it does use account mapping. I know we get that question a lot. Um, yes, it it uses account mapping just like the employer distribution um, program does. All right. 
Okay, any questions when it comes to either um, the report or submission option of retirement employer retirement share? Okay, we will move right along then. Um, and the next step on our um, checklist is to create the ACH submission file. So if I go back to our instance under report, I'm going to go to ACH submission file. Um, I'm going to check then the pay date that I want to generate the um, report and submission file for. So, um, you know, moving back up here um, in the options we have, it the ACH source um, should automatically default from, you know, the ACH source we have set up under core. Um, by default, the employee's SSN will not be included in the submission file. And I think a lot of banks have moved away from that. There might still be some out there that um, still require the SSN be included. And if they do, you can just you know switch that option here from the dropdown. Um, the next option is to um, you know choose your sort. It's automatically defaulting to sort by name. And then you have the option here to, you know, generate the report in um, various uh, formats. So I have my payroll, um, my pay date selected here. I'm going to generate the report. And here is my um, ACH submission file report. Now, again, um, we want to verify that the total is accurate. So on our pay report, if you remember yesterday, we kind of talked through some uh, report summary options um, at the end of the report. Here's the, then our direct deposit total. So we would want to make sure that our direct deposit total matches the um, ACH report. So what we you know process through payroll matches what we're going to, you know, eventually send to the bank. Okay, and in our case, those two totals do match. Um, other things to check on the report, you know, if an employee has changed accounts, we wanna verify, you know, that that looks, you know, accurate. I know you can only see part of the account, but those numbers usually change pretty significantly. So you should be able to tell, you know, that the, the account, um, you know, it has been changed and it looks, looks correct. Maybe a, somebody changed a, a fixed amount that they're having deposited into an account. We can check that as well. So those, you know, are all things that we want to check on the report prior to creating the submission file. Once everything looks correct on the report, um, then we'll be, um, when we create the submission file, one thing to keep in mind is the option, the ability to convert pre-notes um, to actual. So if um, you have a district that still is um, submitting uh, employees through the first time they're paid as pre-notes, um, you have the ability to change that, that option then on their ACH. I can just show you here. I'm sorry, on their pay distribution um, to um, to the correct uh, type of deposit. So here's what we're talking about. Um, you know, if a district is still um, using the prenote method, um, they would set um, the direct deposit type to be pre-notification of you know a savings account or checking account. And then if that's set to pre-note and we generate our ACH submission file and we have this box checked, then it's going to automatically change them to, you know, the automatic method of deposit um, to a checking or savings instead of a pre-note. Okay, so if we don't check this box, next time the employee's paid, they're going to still receive a pre-note um, and they will get a physical check. So we don't probably don't want that to happen. 
All right. So um, again, once we um, verify the report's accurate, we're ready to generate the submission file. If, if you're um, a pre-note district, you would check the box. Let me make sure I have this. And then we're going to generate the submission file. So the, you know, ACH submission file is generated. Then the district is going to take that file then and upload that to their bank, you know, however, whatever method they have arranged um, on the bank side of things. Okay. The next step then is if a district is using, um, if they're an HSA district and they're, you know, have offered that option to their employees, um, then along right beside the uh, ACH submission option is the HSA submission tab. So we're gonna click that. Um, again, very similar to um, generating an H um, an ACH submission file. Um, we have the source, again, that's set up right under the option and core. The option to include or not include um, the SSN. We have the same sort option and then um, the same uh, file or report format options. We would want to check the box then for our specific payroll, generate the report, make sure that looks accurate, and then generate the submission file. And then we're gonna upload the ACH submission file, you know, however they need to, um, to get that to the appropriate bank. Um, one thing to keep in mind is once an ACH submission file is generated, that makes the payroll unpostable. So, if I create the ACH submission file, I will not be able to unpost a payroll. Sometimes um, that has um, caused issues, you know, or districts caused questions, I should say, um, because we haven't we haven't created our our outstanding payables. We haven't done anything with those, um, but we can unpost the payroll. Um, the ACH process does make a payroll um, unpostable. So we've moved that to the end of the um, checklist for that purpose, um, because the very next step is processing your outstanding payables. So these two are basically the last, you know, steps in the sort of regular payroll process. Um, and that's done on purpose. Um, so if they're not an HSA district, when they go to process their um, uh, outstanding payables, then that will make the payroll unpostable once they've done anything with those. All right. Okay, so we'll move um, along then to the outstanding payables. This is option is under processing. So as um, deduction payroll items are, are withheld throughout the payroll process. They get then placed in this outstanding payables area. Um, and those are gonna you know, continue to um, accumulate until that payable is actually paid or posted. Um, there are several tabs. And as we move from left to right, you can see, you're gonna see that the view um, changes. So this just gives us a different way um, to look at um, the specific um, pay payable, I guess. This is uh, a view by payroll item configuration. This is a view by payroll item. And then we have one that's even breaks it down even further. And it's, you know, the detail of by payroll item by employee. So it's it's basically, you know, all the detail that makes up that specific payable. So there might be a, you know, a need to look at the information in a different way. Um, so these tabs then provide um, you the ability to do that. Okay. I'm going to go back to the beginning. Um, so the um, 
the amount that you're gonna see here is controlled by the how the payee is set up. So if I go to core and I go to payee, these are all the various payees that we have created. So, you know, STRS, SERS, um, you know, maybe uh, RITA, CCA, you know, all those various, um, you know, all your annuities, um, you know, American Fidelity and so forth. So once a payee is created, then when I go to the payroll item configuration option, I can actually then set that payee. So it's down here at the bottom. So what is going to combine those amounts on the outstanding payables screen is the, it's all controlled by the payee. So if I have, you know, all of my American Fidelity, those separate payroll items, you know, I have one for maybe disability, one for, um, you know, cancer, one for all the different, um, you know, options that they offer, but they all get sent to the same American Fidelity address. I can then create one payable and that's all controlled by this payee. So if they're this, if, if any of the payroll item configurations have the same payee, that is going to control then um, how they look on the outstanding payables. So it's grouping all of those together, those like payees together, and those amounts will be combined. That's why it's helpful to use, you know, if you need to look at something specifically related to a specific payroll item, you can use the tab to kind of break that down and, and see what's making up that total that we see here. All right, the very first thing that districts are gonna to want to um, do is run their report, the payables reports. So we talked about yesterday, um, if you go to the details of the payroll, there's payable payroll item reports there. That's just showing us what's withheld during that payroll. So districts may be using those to send with something, you know, with their checks, but if it's something that they're, you know, maybe withholding um, each pay and only paying um, once a month or once a quarter, they're probably not going to want to, um, you know, collect all of those reports and put them together to send with, you know, the payment. Um, the other thing that districts want to be careful of is the um, payroll item reports that are processed during the payroll. That's just showing us a picture of what was withheld during the payroll process. That could differ from the payment that we're seeing here because there's the payables adjustments option. So if we need to alter anything um, in our check for any reason, uh, maybe they've sent us a refund, but we haven't processed the refund on the employee side yet, but we wanna send the right amount to the, the, pay the company. Um, we can post an adjustment so obviously, if we're grabbing those reports from each pay, that's going to differ from the actual check that we're creating because of the payables adjustments that could have been posted. So this is a true representation of what's, you know, being um, how the payment is being the details of the payment that we're going to process. Again, we'll want to just like we talked yesterday, you'll want to check the box to page break on payroll item code so that, you know, if you are sending something or using this for balancing, um, then it's, it's you know, a lot easier to, to read through, I think. Um, when it comes to payment cycle, um, districts, I think, you know, can do this multiple ways. They can set up their payment cycles, and that's a, a, a simpler way um, to kind of group all of those payables that you pay every pay monthly, quarterly, annually, or even have user defined. Maybe it's, you know, after the second pay of a three pay month, um, that might be, you know, something that they've set up to be user defined one. These are, these codes are strictly what, what, how it's stated, they're user defined. So, you know, a district has to know that user defined one equals, 
you know, after the second pay of the month. Okay. Um, the other option is to go through and select each and every um, payroll item code that they want to be processed at this time. A little more time consuming, but I know that there are some districts that, that do that. Um, so you can process these one of two ways. Because I misspoke yesterday, which we talked about at the beginning of the um, session, I did want to point out that this payment cycle is looking at the payroll item configuration and how the payment cycle here is set up. So that's what the system is matching to to determine, you know, if we say pay every pay, you know, it's looking and saying, okay, grab all of those um, payables that, that are sitting out there waiting for us to do something with, grab those that the payment cycle equals um, what's set on the payroll item configuration screen. Okay, so hopefully that makes that um, a little more clear. So we're gonna just choose the payment cycle every pay. So again, it's looking at that payroll item configuration, um, the payment cycle, how that's set and grabbing all of those that say every pay. Now we have two report options. One is the full report and one is the summary report. So it's, it's just that. Um, if I click the full report, that's gonna give me the detail of every buddy that makes up that total that we see for um, you know federal, any of those payroll items that we're paying um, you know uh, that we've uh, included in our uh, that we're going to include in our processing. So state and so forth. The other option is going to give us a summary. So a total by code um, of who you know is making up or who how much is going to that specific um, payee. All right. So again, this might be helpful. You know, if districts are sending something um, to along with their payment, you know, this is going to be the true picture of. Um, you know, how those amounts that are getting a cent. And we talked about why the per pay amounts uh, report could be different than the payables report. So those are the two reports. Districts probably want to keep those um, on hand because again, the file archive, um, the full report is just one continuous report. There's no page break. So that can be kind of, um, you know, a pain point to districts if they're if they're wanting to send use that to send it along with something. Um, I'm going to point out or show like the payables adjustment before we actually um, process any kind of payments. So say we have you know received a refund from um, this uh, annuity company here, and we haven't processed the refund of the employee yet. So this this amount hasn't been shorted but we wanna send the right amount to the, um, the deduction company, and then we'll process the refund to the employee. So there might be situations where districts have to process payable adjustments multiple times. So if we create the payable adjustment now and say we need to, um, Oh, that employee has. Let's just pick. Actually, let's um. Let's use state, which is these uh. Actually, let's go to somebody. Okay, six oh three. Um, Ethan Rice. So let's let's pretend that Ethan. We received a refund from this company for $4 for Ethan Rice. So I'm gonna go and it's our 603. So I'm gonna create a payables adjustment. 
one 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 thing I want to point out before we go any further. I want to grab that amount just so we can see the total change. Okay, so currently it's forty-seven dollars. All right, so now we're going to create that payables adjustment for Ethan Rice, and we're going to select. Oops, I didn't select the right one. Six oh three. And now we need to short this payable by $4. And maybe we can just give it a description of um, refund, you know, and the date or something, something that could be helpful in the future. So now we've created that payables adjustment for a negative $4. And when we go back to then that um, specific code for that payable, we can see it, it originally was $47. We posted a payables adjustment for a negative four. So now that um, new payable amount is $43. Okay. So this was then the amount that will be sent once we process the payable um, sent to the, um, the company. If we then refund that amount that four dollars to the employee keep in mind that that's going to place a negative four dollars back out in you know the the payables so we would see you know a negative four um and it will try to automatically short the next time this payable is processed so there might be cases where districts need to go out you know they've already sent the correct amount the last time they, they don't want to short this check. They might need to create a payables adjustment again to not short that that check that was, you know, shorted by the, excuse me, by the refund amount um, so that the right amount is sent this time as, you know, the next time as well. So there's situations, and again, it's so situational, you can't say this is how it's always needs to be done. But I think just be mindful of you know, what's happening and how, how, you know, what we've done, you know, currently what's going to happen next and what needs to happen after that. Um, <clears throat> so just kind of wanted to step you through those, you know, how you can adjust the amount of a check um, so that it gets, um, you know, the right amount gets sent to um, the company this time. Um, so once we've run our reports, everything looks good. We have copies of those if we want them. Um, we then select the um, payment cycle on the, the grid here. And once we select a, a payroll um, cycle, then it's going to narrow down um, the, the records that we see, the payees that we see on the grid. So again, it's looking at that payment cycle on the payroll item configuration screen, matching those based on what we've selected here. And these then will be the payables that you know, we want to process um, at this time. If every all of these are truly um, ones that we wish to continue um, creating payments for, then we're gonna check the box and that's gonna select all of these and move them to the right-hand side. OK, um, if for whatever reason there's one that we don't want to process at this time, um, maybe we're waiting on a an invoice or something, you can uncheck a box, um, you know, and that will move them from, you know, the, the right side back to the left side and they won't be included in the processing. I'm going to click post. It's going to bring up the option then to create a, um, or select a issue date. So it's going to default to the current date. Um, I know a lot of times districts like to use the pay date. So, you know, they have the ability to change the date um, if they'd like. It's going to prompt us for our bank account um, and then the output um, option. So, you know, I'm assuming that most are using a third party software that requires the XML option. Um, so we're going to, you know, keep that. As XML, it will default to the next available check number, and we're going to click Post. 
yeah, our dates. I forgot about that. We are back in time here. So now once those payables are posted, um, you're gonna see that those lines then get removed from the grid. So the grid behind us, these amounts are moved out. Um, we have our payables payment report and we have our checks.xml file. So this then gives us a, a good look at the check numbers, whether they were electronically paid or not, that's what the asterisk means, the date we issued the checks for, who the checks were made payable to, the amount, the payroll item codes. So if um, the same payee is set on more than one payroll item code, those are listed um, separately um, in the details option, which is super nice because you could have, you know, all of your or multiple city um, payroll items going to, um, you know, all going to Rita or something. So those would be listed out separately. Um, and then they're all being sent to the same place. Um, and then the appropriate amount for each of those um, payroll items are listed um, on the appropriate line. So again, I know districts use this report then for balancing, you know, at the end of the month, into the quarter. Um, so the payables payment report um, can be helpful in that way. So again, once we've posted those, then you can see that they're removed from the grid um, and the only um, payables that are left are those that we have not done some, anything with. Those are, are gonna remain um, you know, on the grid until we actually pay those or post them. Okay. All right. That's processing our outstanding payables. Um, next on our list is processing our leave accruals. So districts, you know, process these in different ways. They um, process them at different times of the month um, or year. So um, just an overview as to how, um, you know, how it works. Um, if you go to processing, um, we're going to use the benefit update and projection option. And you can see here, there's various tabs um, within this option as well. Probably, you know, the one that they're going to be using throughout the school year is the accrual option. Um, and this is going to allow them to accrue sick leave, personal leave, um, sick leave and, vac or, and vacation, um, all types of leave. Um, lots of districts, you know, reset their personal leave at, at a certain time, you know, at the start of the school year. So they might not be accruing their personal leave, they're resetting that. Um, and then at the end of the year, you know, they're using or can use these um, additional options to convert their personal leave that's been unused to either paying them or sick leave. Um, and then there's an option for the part-time sick leave accrual as well. So most generally, you know, at the end, sometime throughout probably the, the month, or each month, um, the, the district is running this accrual option and they're generating the report first and then they're gonna generate the actual accrual. So by default, it's set to accrual projection report. And then we have to select what type of accrual we're wanting to um, generate the report for. Is it personal leave, sick leave, sick and vacation or just vacation. So based on, you know, how the district is set up to accrue their benefits, um, I'm just gonna select sick leave and then we're gonna enter a specific accrual date. So I'm just gonna use the end of the month that we've been processing for. You have the ability to um, sort this in various ways and then the ability to generate um, this report for pay groups or even specific employees. So I'm gonna go ahead and generate this report here. 
and I can show you what, what it looks like. We have by employee then their balance, what will be accumulated, and then what their new balance will be. So this is for, in this case, just sick leave um, because that's all we generated the, the report for. If everything looks good, um, then we're going to change this accrual projection report to accrual report. Um, that's then going to actually post the accrual to the employee. So give them um, you know, what we saw, the accrual amount on this report. Okay, so their balance will be updated um, at that time. I'll you know briefly just switch over to the reset option. Um, again, this might not be something that the districts are using on a regular basis, um, maybe once throughout the year. Um, but again, it looks very similar to the accrual option and the fact that you can have the projection option versus the actual option. Um, you'll set up a, a specific accrual date, and then you have the ability to select by pay groups. Okay, by not selecting anything, remember that selects everybody. So if we don't have a specific employee or group to select, then we'll just leave the, the selected, um, the right side blank, um, and that will by default select everybody. Okay. All right. Then lastly, um, that kind of like concludes the, the actual payroll process. Um, I did want to touch real quickly because I know we're past our time on um, refunding a payroll item. We do have um, a ch checklist, so to speak, on how um, to refund a payroll item to an employee. <clears throat> Anytime, I'm gonna go back to my employee here that I've been using. If I go to payroll items and I pick, um, I'm gonna pick this annuity. When I go down to air adjustments and I create an adjustment for this employee, um, I'm not going to put a date here. I'm just going to put um, and I click save. If I use a date, this um, date has to be um, used in conjunction with the pay date, the payroll that you want um, this adjust, the error adjustment to be processed in. So if you don't want control of that and you just want it to be processed the next time the payroll is run, then you do not have to enter a date in the error adjustment field and it'll automatically be pulled um, into that payroll. So make sure once you create the error adjustment, I guess I should have showed you that real quick. It's down here in the grid. Then we're going to save it. When I go to Processing and then payroll item refund. You're going to see then if I search by that employee that um, error adjustment that I just um, entered. So this test error adjustment. The other place that you can see them now, and it's it, I think it's really super helpful. If I go to core and I go to payroll item. I can go down to air adjustment and there's even, you know, an option for the employer air adjustment. You can see here um, in the payroll items air adjustment grid um, that it's list, all of the air adjustments are listed here as well. The nice thing about this is we can see then if they've been processed or not. So if you want to go to one place, you know, and see whether they've been paid or not, um, you can go to the option under payroll um, item as well. And it gives you the date, okay? So maybe, you know, you need to look back at something and, you know, not really sure my, maybe what check 
that was processed on, this is going to show us that. And then we can go to that employee's, you know, payment for that specific date and see, oh yeah, you know, I see, I see what happened here. Okay. So I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that, um, because it is a newer option that that was available as well. Um, the nice thing about the um, air adjustments now um, versus like maybe in our classic system is that these can be processed outside of a payroll um, without with just a couple clicks. So maybe this employee had you know health insurance withheld. Maybe it's their last pay. Um, maybe you know we need to get this to them. We want we don't want to wait until the next time they're paid. Um, these can be processed by clicking then um, this box here um, and clicking the refund selected air adjustment um, option. And when I do that, it gives me a pop-up window and it actually allows me to create a physical check or even an ACH payment. So I can, you know, I don't have to physically, you know, mail a check to the employee or, you know, hand it to them. I can actually just create another ACH file um, by, you know, choosing the ACH electronic payment option, selecting my date, um, and then I process the refund and that's going to create my ACH file that I can then upload, you know, to the bank um, and process. Then they'll, pro you know, they would get their funds that way. Um, again, you can create a physical check using the XML option, and then, you know, that creates the XML file that then you'd upload to your um, printing software, and that would create the, the check, um, the payment that way. Okay. All right, let's go back to our checklist then. And then lastly, we just have a link to processing a special pay. We kind of, you know, briefly talked about that when we initialized the payroll yesterday. So I'm not going to revisit that. Um, we, we, you know, have this checklist here, this link provided that I guess I can click on and show you here. Whoops. It's thinking. And that's a checklist right along with our um, other checklist, you know, for throughout the year. All right. Okay, I apologize because we did go over our time. Um, does anybody have any questions on anything that we covered um, today at all? See anything in the chat? All right. Well, again, um, I you know appreciate you um, you know being with us this week for the last three days. Um, we will get those the recordings you know out on our um, meetings and trainings um, ITC overview trainings and materials page. Um, once we have gotten those um, gotten time to break those um, videos down, um, but. Feel free to you know, share this with your districts, go out there and use it yourself whenever um, you, know, you need to. Um, and again, I want to thank you for your time this week, and I hope everybody has a wonderful day and a great rest of their week. Thank you.